Hi, this is Anthony Parent of IRS Medic. And we have some uh, exciting news in this podcast today. There is a new organization uh, that has started up. It's called Stop Extraterritorial American Taxation. For those who live overseas and have been frustrated, maybe you feel like neither party is quite representing you or people are fighting over things that they don't really understand. This is it. And I got to tell you, these are people that I've known for years. And it is just an all star of the people who really care. I'm mean, people I really, really like and who are really out there looking at this for fairness. And by the way, we got Republicans and Democrats in here. So this is a bipartisan committee of people who want fair taxation and really want to stop a lot of the ignorance. I mean, incredible ignorance of befalling our land about taxation. I want to talk to Laura Snyder first. She's a president. Now, Laura is also a member of the Taxpayer Advocacy Panel, and that's how I hooked up with her. I was helping her out with a little bit of project and some of her research. She's done incredible research into the plight of Americans overseas who have to file their taxes. There are so many things that are a little crazy with it. And, you know, number one thing that I see number one, is the problem is that the U.S. collects far too income, to far too little revenue for the a massive amount of work they create. It's resources better spent elsewhere. Laura, thank you for joining me today. And thank you for starting what a great organization. Now, what did you what 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 caused you to start this? Hi, Anthony. Thanks. Well, I certainly did not do this alone. As you know, there are six of us. And um, what caused us to do this is that we think that there's a need for an organization that is um, nonpartisan, that's not linked to the tax compliance industry, and that is 100 yeah. percent focused on the issue of extraterritorial taxation. Um, we think that um, it's going to be uh, easier to uh, work in a very focused manner on that issue um, within that context. Uh, it's wonderful. That, and, and, and number, yeah, it's nonpartisan. And so we're all united together and just something fair. And we can sort of, you know, drop our badges and just look at this from from what's really happening. I think that will help everybody. And then I think the second thing you mentioned is pretty, pretty critical. No one here, you know, th that this is not an industry that is a representative of the tax compliance industry. And as we have all discussed, we have seen the tax um, compliance industry act in ways contra to the best interests of taxpayers. Um, many of the large preparers want it to be this complicated because it's revenue for them. Um, thank you very much, Laura. Now, uh, our next guest is Karen Alpert. We've had Karen on before, um, and she is brilliant, um, and especially on the U.S.-Australia tax treaty. She's she's the founder of the Fix the Australia-U.S. Tax Treaty. We've had her on before, and she's really trying hard to get some big changes done Karen, it's so nice to uh, speak with you. So what motivated you to join this group and help promote it? Well, you see, Anthony, I'm, I'm nearing retirement. And I figured out about four years ago that there was no way it would be possible to be funded here in Australia for my retirement and also be a U.S. citizen. And I had to make the decision to give up my U.S. citizenship in order to live a normal financial life just like any other Australian. And I really felt that that was unfair. And so since that time, I've been really doing what I can to highlight the issues and um, try and work, out, work it so that nobody else has to do what I had to do, which is hand in a U.S. passport just to be able to live overseas. You know, Karen, and all the time I've known you, I didn't know that you had to do that. I didn't know that you, uh, when, did, when did you give up your U.S. citizenship? Uh, I gave it up in 2016. 2016. And it, and there's really great reason. I mean, Karen absolutely has to. Karen's not alone in this. Uh, we have clients around the world, and there's many people. We've shared stories of people who are in tears giving up their U.S. citizenship because there's no way they can afford to be in compliance um, and be double, double, triple tax sometimes. Um, so, uh, Karen, it's great that you're on this. I mean, uh, you, you, you're tremendously talented. Um, so that's just fantastic. Um, next guest is Keith Redman. Keith has always been a great guest. Keith is a constant guest, and he is somebody who uh, really helps motivate people and really organized. He organized. He helped organize a great hearing we had in 2017, um, Capitol, and we're talking about repealing the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, otherwise known as FACA. So, Keith. How do you feel about this? Well, I'll be honest with you. Uh, in all sincerity, I'm very excited about this organization for two key reasons and the uniqueness of it. 
number one, that our focus is to end the U.S. imposing its tax code outside the U.S. on tax residents of other countries. That is our sole focus. We are not dealing with any other issues but this particular issue. The second part that I feel that is very unique is that this organization is all inclusive of everyone who is adversely affected by the way the U.S. Uh, practices its extraterritorial taxation. So that means it's not only for just Americans living overseas, but green card holders living right. overseas, accidental Americans, and their respective uh, family members. So it's for anyone and everyone that is adversely affected by this. So that's why that this organization is filling a niche that has not been filled before. And I am just looking forward and moving forward with this, uh, with the work that we need to do. Keith, it sounds wonderful because sort of my experience is organizations that are one issue focused tend to be successful. The ones who scatter their efforts and try to make everybody happy, even though in a way we're kind of trying to make everybody happy, we're just trying to alert them to what's actually going on. The only people who probably wouldn't want change of this, of what's going on, are people in the tax compliance industry who stand to make a fortune off of these holes that the U.S. government requires expats and others to fill in. Um, so the fact that this is just a one-issue organization that anybody, anybody who thinks the U.S. tax system – how it taxes people abroad on anything they make, anywhere they make it, in addition, and in addition, these incredibly difficult and if not impossible to file uh, foreign informational returns, uh, this is the place for you. It doesn't matter what you are. It doesn't matter if you're Democrat, Republican, something else. This is for everybody who's sick and tired of the status quo. Um, Absolutely. And I should, I should also add, which I forgot, it's also for former Americans, Americans who were forced into renouncing, they are all included in this because it's adversely affected them as well for obvious reasons. Yeah, there's too many of them. Too many Americans have been forced to give up um, their citizenship just because they found an opportunity somewhere else in the world. And that just doesn't seem like the American dream to me. Not at all. Our next case guest is David Johnstone. And David was on a call with me uh, with, with Laura. Uh, we've, we've talked before. David is a United States citizen who has lived in France since 2002. He formerly worked in investment banking in Paris. Uh, and, and so, David, you have to know, <laughs> you must be intimately familiar with sort of how these regulations on U.S. persons are sort of hurting them around the world. My question for you is what motivated you to get involved in this group and, and help lead it? Well, thanks, Anthony. It's uh, nice to talk to you again. Um, so I was motivated to join this uh, this uh, group of uh, founding members um, because of my situation. I used to be an investment banker, so I'm used to dealing with kind of complicated stuff. Um, but um, then I uh, became I went on a sick leave, and now I've been disabled for the last five years. And so um, I, for the last few years, I've had to literally choose between uh, complying with my U.S. tax filing obligations and uh, having a chance to recover. I spent literally one month doing nothing else but my U.S. tax um, uh, filing. Um, it would take me two or three hours if I was living in the U.S. Um, and had my assets in the U.S. Um, and so every year I spend a few months recovering from the effort of having to do my U.S. tax filing. Oh, and by the way, <coughs> um, when I tried to find, tried to get uh, information to answer my questions from the IRS, couldn't get a hold of them um, within or with anybody knowledgeable um, without waiting several hours on the phone, which I can't do. Um, and um, I've, I figure out that actually, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, um, uh, having hiring an external uh, tax preparer for, for me will actually increase the amount of time that I'll that I'll spend doing this. So oh, I do think something. Wow. And so wow. Uh, so that's I, something you just said right there. That was an amazing thing what you just said. You just said if you ha have someone help you with this, it will increase your time filing requirement. I think I know the reason why, but you could you just explain to people why that's the case. That's the, okay, in my case it's because of the uh, of just uh, keeping track of the documents, saving them, and then having to go back and forth with the, the advisor 
um, uh, to, to, to ensure that everything is, you know, properly formatted and, you know, all the information is there for the U.S. and that I'm not missing anything. I think that's the main thing. Um, the second thing is just checking over because of the number of additional forms that I have to file just for the fact of living abroad. And maybe, maybe I can just add that um, I, one of the other motivating factors that I joined this group is because I'm disabled, I noticed um, uh, as time went on that I wasn't the only one in this situation um, and that a lot of them either aren't filing because they just don't have the, the resources to do so or they're getting they're paying taxes when they don't owe them because they're using prepare, some of the cheaper preparers that are based and not necessarily where they live who don't know um, the rule, the, the uh, tax treaty rules. So a lot of people are paying tax that they don't owe. And sure I'm, and I wanted to help uh, uh, people out so that, you know, so that this situation wouldn't happen again, um, you know, perhaps in the future for other people who are either disabled or retired, people who don't have the mental or physical capacity or energy um, to deal with the, the, just the enormous workload um, and sometimes overpayment um, uh, that entails with living abroad and not having earned income from work. You just brought up a great point because I think I remember this from uh, our call with the taxpayer advocate and somebody brought this up um, that if you receive U.S. welfare benefits but live overseas, you're taxed on those welfare benefits. Well, no, U.S. welfare oh, sorry. benefits. I'm sorry, U.S. But but if you're if you're given if you if you're given a disability in France, it's not taxable in France, but it will be taxable to the U.S. And it'll be taxable at a higher rate than um, U.S. Social Security income. Right. So the the whole no right, which is sort of the the irony is the whole dream of this progressive income tax was that hey, people on the small at at the end of the scale, you know, they really won't have to pay anything, or actually we might give them money, and then people who are at the higher end of the scale will pay a proportionally larger percentage of the income because the argument goes they could afford it well here we go here is what has occurred we are absolute we're, we're actually in the absurd position where someone who is destitute disabled living on state aid is taxed at a higher rate than than nearly anyone else um so what a great what a great uh what a great uh, it's great that you're on this david what, what a great use of your talents to help others uh who are facing this and you're you're absolutely right the um, you know the the international preparation is so difficult. People will overreport their taxes and underreport. Um, both things are somewhat dangerous. But as we have seen, the IRS you know for all the threats that the IRS has done and all the compliance that goes through, this is sort of the point that I've seen and sort of the point that I'm coming around. You're kind of at this point, you're kind of a fool to comply. Um, and here's why I'll say that is that the audit rate for those who live overseas, and this was just a report that came out, is far, far below the audit rate of domestic um, uh, domestic filers. And the reason why, and when you, when you hear the reason why, you just want to pull your hair out. The reason why is because international examinations are too difficult for IRS employees. And so very few of them want to do it. The reason why they're too complicated. Now, why are they not fired or let go? Well, because the IRS has a resourcing staff and they know there's not really anyone else in the world who they could replace that person with who would be more willing to work on international examinations. And that's how absurd it is that you have a code that the enforcement agency doesn't want to enforce. And so if you're overseas, you have to be wondering to yourself, well, why am I doing all of this? Why am I doing all of this? when the chances of me being examined are so low. And it's at that point where the compliance falls off. And that's really the risk here is where when people openly mock the law, which is in a way it's nearly openly mocked. It's not quite. Um, it's just breeds contempt for the law. And, you know, here we have the United States government trying to extend its tax jurisdiction beyond its physical borders. Tons of problems there. And I think this brings me to um, our, our closing guest, John Richardson, uh, one of my favorite attorneys, if not my favorite attorney. I love his insight, uh, his way to, to cut through the nonsense, his knowledge of tax and citizenship law. I don't know if it's surpassed by anyone else. He's the expert that I go to. John, so um, how do you feel about all of this? Well, uh, I, I don't like citizenship taxation uh, at all. Um, 
a couple points, though, just sort of to bring together some of the previous comments, uh, which which have been so, so interesting. Um, one of my observations over the years, Karen <clears throat> described how she was forced to renounce U.S. citizenship. Well, that's because she was in the U.S. tax system. It's It's fascinating to me. That it's the ones who are in the system and trying to comply who are forced, who actually end up having to renounce. So for all these non-compliant people, uh, I have come to see that coming into compliance is the first step towards renunciation because it's uh, it's not only is it expensive and time-consuming, but what uh, Karen implied but didn't quite say was that uh, compliance with U.S. tax laws for overseas Americans. Uh, generally creates conflicts with uh, responsible saving financial planning and pension plans in other countries. So in other words, if you want your American citizenship, you're not going to be having the same kind of retirement and financial planning opportunities that are absolutely essential for you. So that's the first point. Compliance means renunciation. The only thing you're really betting on is time. Second thing, uh, it is astounding, uh, you know, listening to David, uh, and if I could sort of generalize, uh, you know, he was a great specific instance of a general principle, and that's this, that, and this is a simple fact, or should I say fact of the matter, is that the United States, the effect of the rules is to impose a significantly, not only more complex, but far more punitive tax system on Americans abroad. So it's not as if, you know, we're talking about the same kind of income and it's taxed in the same way. Absolutely not. I mean, even to take something as simple as a mutual fund, uh, it is understood that uh, uh, mutual funds that are not purchased in the United States are going to be taxed in a far more punitive way, for example, essentially uh, adding to the complexity of, uh, of retirement planning. So again, to be clear, it's far more than the United States imposing worldwide taxation on people who live outside the United States and are tax residents of other countries. It's far more than that. What it is, is they're imposing a far more punitive and difficult tax system. So, you know, I think that's extremely important. Oh, all right. There's your, okay. That's a great point. Okay. So not only is it extraterritorial taxation? Okay, we're going to give you different rules if if you live overseas. That are far. You're absolutely right. Right. That's a great. You know that kind of goes right by you. It's not an equal system of taxation at all, at all. If you are self-employed overseas, working through some sort of LLC equivalent, you likely will have a fifty-four seventy-one filing obligation. That, by the way, the IRS's own estimates will say. What David say? A month of time? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, no, no. The IRS's own estimates of these things are like 20, 40 hours just to do this one form. And that's just for your record keeping. Now you have to fill the form in. Now you have to understand the law. So there's no such equivalent when you own an LLC in the United States. You might even be able to put that, uh, that LLC on a Schedule C. It couldn't really be any easier than that. And that is a huge, huge problem. The vast difference in the treatment of what you're required to do. Now, the requirement we believe, I believe, is because you're trying to assert something over which you don't have physical boundaries. But does that limitation, does the limitation of the federal government now require or now reduce the right of people, to, uh, uh, does that reduce people's rights to privacy, to sort of a fair and just system of taxation? It's like, well, that's the government's for Hey, government, this is what I would say, IRS, that's your problem. The fact that you want to tax people overseas and you have a difficult time seeing what's going on with them, that's your problem. And maybe the solution is not to tax people overseas. Maybe you could try that. Um, then you wouldn't have all these problems. And that sort of gets back to, to my original point, the amount of resources the IRS puts into this um, yeah. and, the amount of, and the, the amount of resources the IRS puts into something that they actually don't examine that much. Right. That's sort of the problem because the people who they do hit they need to make an example out of, and boy, do they hit. Oh my God. You know, and as we, we talked um, about this, you, you mentioned to me the 50th anniversary of the F bars coming up on October 26th, um, 2020 celebrating uh, its birthday. The bank secrecy of net act of 1970 gave birth to the F bar. And that Mr. is not, that is a Mr. F bar. Mr. F bar comes into play requiring all these things. And it's something, if you have a domestic account, you never need to file an F-bar. 
You don't have to worry about this penalty. Oh, but you have a bank account somewhere overseas. Now you have to worry about it. And if you don't do it, it's a $10,000 penalty. The IRS can assess with a snap of their fingers. They might get you for more, but they could get you for that $10,000 pretty quick. That is, that is what we're dealing with. Yeah, well, what you're describing um, are the are the compliance things, which are, are draconian, they're medieval, they're absurd. And they also clearly assume that there's no difference between a U.S. citizen who happens to be trying to eke out a living and live outside the United States. There's no difference between that person and a homeland tax cheat or a multinational who's trying to shift income to a lower tax jurisdiction. Right. And this is the problem. So, I mean, another way of looking at the whole uh, U.S. system of citizenship taxation would be to ask a simple question. Is it reasonable to treat somebody who lives outside the country as a presumptive tax cheat and or a multinational who's trying to use transfer pricing to reduce taxation? You know, uh, and I would think that any rational person would think, no, that's not reasonable. But we're not talking rational. We're talking U.S. Treasury and Congress. Um, I would like to add, though, to what you're saying, what you were saying about the Schedule C and the small business owner and stuff like that. Uh, you know, you, you, you rightly focus on the burdensome and costly procedural and regulatory requirements. But to get back to the taxation, you know, you have these Americans living outside the United States who carry on business through small business corporations. Let's not forget that in 2017, as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, just because they had these small businesses outside the United States, they were subjected to the Section 965 transition tax, which was a retroactive mm. confiscation of the retained earnings in those corporations which were earmarked for their retirement. So in other words, not only as David points out, does the United States impose high and punitive taxation on welfare benefits received by citizens of other countries who happen to have been born in the United States at the other extreme? I mean, those are the people who, who are being hit with stuff that's not saving for retirement, bare survival. But for those who use these small business corporations to save for their retirement, they literally confiscated those retirement pensions. So, And now this, to continue on a little bit, has implications for the sovereignty of other countries. To put it real simple, the United States is basically stealing from the tax base of other countries through this tax system. Now, I remember years ago, Representative Treasury said, well, we need FATC and all this stuff to preserve the U.S. tax base. Oh, no one of the biggest lies of all time. In fact, what these rules do is extend the U.S. tax base into other countries. Mm -hmm. And this is fairly obvious. I mean, if we look at, for example, the claim in 2017 that, uh, you know, they moved to territorial taxation for corporations, they actually did not because there were so many exceptions that ate the rule. When they moved to territorial taxation, what the United States did was simply expand the territory in the world over which they were trying to exercise uh, U.S. tax tax policy and jurisdiction. And this is a, a tremendous assault on the sovereignty of other countries. And countries need to wake up. Individuals need to wake up. Congress has got to adopt some common sense. And this has got to stop. You're absolutely right. That's beautifully said. I want to conclude with Laura. Laura, what's our, and I want to thank all our guests, Laura Snyder, Keith Redman, Karen Alpert. Um, now, with Susan Herman was a guest here, but she's not here today. Uh, I want to thank J David Johnson and, of course, John Richardson. So, in closing, Laura, what should people listening to this do? What what can they expect if they join seat, uh, seatnow.org? Well, what we'd like people to do right now are two things. Um, first of all, we have um, prepared a survey, uh, a pretty comprehensive survey, to try and get an idea, a better idea of just how uh, – current and former Americans uh, living overseas, including accidental Americans and green card holders. We want to get a, a very good understanding of how they're experiencing these policies. So we've developed a pretty comprehensive survey to try and get um, some information that we can uh, put into a report and publish. And uh, so number one, I would say, please uh, go to our website and look around our website. Uh, participate in the survey. You'll find a link to the survey on our website. And uh, also sign up to get our, for, you know, sign up for our mailing list so that you can be informed about what our other activities are and how you can support those other activities. 
So people really have a place now to here's your con. I see you, you've put your contact in on the website and the, the, uh, the survey is going to close on November 30th of 2020, but people really now have a place to go, um, to say, Hey, um, here's some things I'm thinking of, and here's some things I want to get involved with. Um, and we've done a great job with, uh, without this organization, but boy, I think we can do a lot better now. Um, thank you so all so much for joining me today. And thank you all so much for, getting this going. I'm really looking forward to what this single issue uh, uh, organization will do. I think it's going to bring a lot of people together and really start educating the people who are unaware, as many of us are, we watch current politics and it's sort of, we, 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 it just hurts. It hurts when you hear um, pundits talk about the tax code of things they have no clue. They have no clue. And it, it, it hurts when you hear the media report, uh, repeat the, 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 the points. This is a very, very complicated issue of law. And, you know, you really need to understand it fully before you start commenting on it. And unfortunately, there's no qualifications for people to comment on this. Um, they just sort of spout off on ignorance. So I'm looking forward to see to uh, help illuminate um, people to see really what's going on. And is it really a good idea to have a government all powerful everywhere, everywhere in the world? I don't think so. Um, this is Anthony Parent, and I thank you for joining us today, and be sure to subscribe. We'll, I'm sure we're going to have some more of these guests with some of the updates that are coming up. Thanks again.